Okay, case eight. We're almost there, guys. Uh, 50 year old, sorry, 50 year old woman with a large pendulous masses of the bilateral thighs, the uh, body mass index BMI 65, which is very, very high. Um, okay, so we've got three slides here. Here's number one. Here's number two. Here's number three. Okay. Any takers? Who wants to put all this together for me? That's a crack in the class, by the way. I'll just give it a shot. Okay. So, uh, we, you know, you see a lot of this edema between the, the collagen fibers. Oh, I love that you picked up on that. Yes, good. Lots of white space. Good. You know, you sort of go in, it's sort of more of these sort of spindle type uh, pairing cells. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other slide with the uh, adipose tissue, I thought we sort of saw some fiber bands sort of intersecting some of, the, some of the fat. Yeah, here's a big expanded fibers band right here. It's I wish I had a bigger piece to show you how it, yeah, there, you got a little taste of it here that it's intersecting between the fat. If you get a big enough piece, you can see, I guess we have some on this. There we go. Expanded fibers band intersecting fat. Good. Oh, looks like this was massive localized lymphedema. Oh, well done, sir. Yes. This is massive localized lymphedema, which is really important to know about because it can be so large that it forms a tumor-like mass clinically, and it almost the vast majority of it occurs in patients with uh, morbid obesity. And uh, because they have a really extreme lymphedema that compounds on itself and scars down, and it's chronic lymphedema that then becomes kind of sagging and hangs down and forms mass-like lesions that continue to enlarge over time as they get more edematous and more scarred down, okay? And there are other times where you can see it like in the scrotum and some other settings, but the times I've seen it by far the most are in, in patients with morbid obesity, okay? Now I'm gonna show you the clinical photos, which are pretty dramatic. So here you can see the, the skin of the thighs is really in multiple folds hanging down. And there's also a large panis here hanging down. And, um, and then you can see from this view here that you can see how they form like a pedunculated mass like lesion that hangs down from the inner thigh on both sides. These are often bilateral and that's an important clue to recognize that even though this looks mass like and tumor like, it's probably lymph edema. And uh, here is a different view from behind where you can see the one side uh, better. So this obviously you can imagine is a terribly morbid problem for the patient who has this kind of obesity and um, that obesity like this is a really serious problem and not an easy solvable solution because even with weight loss, people once they develop this degree of lymphedema, just like we were looking in that rhinophyma case and the dermis gets scarred, the dermis and chronic lymphedema, even without massive localized lymphedema, the dermis and chronic lymphedema becomes scarred down and it basically can never fully return to normal, um, even with weight loss or things done to try to improve the lymphedema, which is really unfortunate. Lymphedema is a terribly um, problematic, morbid condition for people, whether it's because of obesity, radiation, lymph node dissection or other, it can be really morbid and painful. And also people with chronic lymphedema over many years, they can have a risk of developing angiosarcoma secondary to the lymphedema. So. Let's go back here and look at these slides now that we've seen the clinical. So this form of lymphedema here, um, this actually has, I love that you picked up that there's extra white space in the dermis. Sometimes edema is very subtle. Here there's white space, but there's also something else. The dermis is scarred. This is way more dense, more packed together dense collagen rather than the nice divided, you know, um, reticular dermal collagen, which would look like bundles like this. Here we have packed together sheets of collagen with an increased number of enlarged kind of hyperchromatic fibroblasts and myofibroblasts in the middle. So we have both scar from the chronicity of it, plus the white space of the edema. It's still got edema fluid in there, but the dermis is so unhappy about it that it's begun to scar in between the edema. So this combination of sclerotic collagen with edema is really characteristic. If I see that on the lower leg, that screams chronic lymphedema to me. The other thing that tells me lymphedema, because these are kind of, this is again, not a tumor. So these are subtle things, non-tumoral um, reactive processes often trick people because they're not things that are commonly seen or commonly taught about. So I think it's important to know we had it, where was it? Oh yeah, there. The other thing is these are lymphatics. 
normal lymphatics are little round spaces. These are dilated and kind of geographic, spiky, angulated edges, you know, uh, branching out in multiple directions. This is because of lymphatic stasis. Backflow pressure on the lymphatics makes these lymphatics dilate and kind of get ectatic and, and irregular in shape over time. So I feel like when I see significant chronic lymphedema, almost always you can find some lymphatic channels that are dilated like that, plus the edema, plus the scar, and as in any sort of chronic reactive thing that affects the dermis, like chronic arterial insufficiency, chronic lymphedema, you begin to get an increased number of fibroblasts compared to normal dermis. So if you're not sure, go compare this to dermis on a normal slide, because at first glance, you're like, it's pink, it's dermis. And it takes a while to recognize the subtlety of the cellularity of the dermis and the collagen pattern compared to normal. But when you have it back to back, we don't have any normal here. But if you get a normal piece and compare, you'll see just how abnormal the collagen is in this. So this is all chronic lymphedema. And this same kind of pattern of fibrosis and, and edema often expands down into the subcutis. Oh, look, there's another dilated lymphatic. See, you can even like probably see a touch of valve right there, probably. Sometimes you can really nicely see valves on lymphatics. Um, and then it expands down. We'll come back and talk about the epidermis in a minute. I Don't let me forget. Okay, and then what it does is in the subcutis, normally, a normal subcutis has lobules of fat with a very thin fibrous septa in between, but these septa expand and get fibrotic, sclerotic, scarred, plus edema, plus increased spindle cells in them. And the problem with this is that clinically, if they submit this as a large mass on the thigh in the soft tissue, and you get fat that you see mature fat, mature adipocytes, plus fibrous bands, plus some slightly enlarged spindle cells, you might start thinking about well-differentiated liposarcoma, which we call by the name, alter, uh, the alternative name of atypical lipomatous tumor. That's the proper name for well-diff liposarcoma when it occurs in the extremities or the superficial soft tissue. We call it well-diff liposarcoma when it's in the retroperitoneum and atypical lipomatous tumor. Um, even though that sounds like a descriptive made up name, that's actually the proper name for it when it's in superficial soft tissue or in the extremities because it behaves so much better there. But anyway, it can have overlap. Classic well, diff liposarc ALT will have hyperchromatic pleomorphic cells, but you can have very subtle cases that have very little atypia and look a lot like, like a lipoma with some fibrous bands. So I've seen cases where people sent these in a consult thinking they were liposarcoma and they were all just reactive fat change from chronic lymphedema. So it's actually a very important distinction to make because you know, you're, you're talking about a big surgery and a, labeling someone with a cancer diagnosis or a kind of like cancer diagnosis. So all of this is reactive fat change. As fat gets reactive, the vessels in it begin to get more prominent, especially when you get fat atrophy. So you can begin to see more vascularity than you do in normal fats. You can get little pockets of fat necrosis, lymphocytes and histiocytes. All of that reactive stuff can happen, which makes the fat look even more abnormal and cellular. All this is benign and reactive here. See, look how vascular this is. This is because this area probably got a little bit of atrophy. And so the normal vascular network that exists in all adipose tissue in our body to allow lipids to exchange in and out of the fat cells, they come closer together as the adipocytes get smaller and kind of shrunk down and you begin to see more of the vessels and it looks scary and you're like, ooh, are those like chicken wire vessels of myxoid liposarcoma? Sometimes people can confuse it with that uh, if you get some kind of atrophic changes. So that's just reactive. And that vast, those vessels are not the vessels of angiolipoma, just in case you're wondering. Those vessels are little clustered capillaries with thrombi in them. And I've got some videos about that you can check out. So I know it's a lot to take in, and I'll try to cover it all real fast. Here, see? Oh, and then look, on this scan, those look like hyperchromatic cells. If I recall correctly, those were actually hemocytorin-laden um, histiocytes that just didn't quite scan and focus um, on the slide because there probably been a little bit of hemorrhage into the tissue over time. I think there's a bit more in here. The other thing here that's going on in this patient is there's some fine calcifications. A little hard to appreciate, but we have some fine calcs here that are probably calcified elastic fibers. And was it the last piece of tissue? Also some calcified vessels. Now, you can see calcified vessels as a reactive change, in particularly in older adults or people with hypertension called Monkeyberg's arteriosclerosis. You can also see calcified fibers as a non-specific finding. I particularly see it in the legs of older adults or people with bad vascular flow. But the other thing, especially in a patient that probably has type 2 diabetes, you have to wonder about their renal function. And if potentially this could be some of the precursor calcifications 
that's maybe due to secondary hyperparathyroidism, chronic renal failure, and maybe incipient calciphylaxis. Clearly, this is clinically not calciphylaxis here, but I sometimes see changes like this in renal failure patients, and I always want them to watch the patient closely because I worry that the reason they may be depositing extra calcium is that they've got a parathyroid abnormality driven by their renal failure, and that some of these cases, I suspect, will go on to progress to, to actual occlusion of vessels and calciphylaxis. So when I see this in the setting of a renal failure patient, I do mention it and then say I don't see acute ischemia or clinical features of calciphylaxis, but uh, these changes may be um, calcification that are related to the renal failure and, and they need to be watched closely. So just an FYI there, and I've got other videos about calciphylaxis um, that you can look at if you're curious. So oh, that's a lot of stuff to cover, but it's a really complex thing and, um, and I'm kind of, uh, if you can't tell, a little fascinated. Now, the last thing about it, and then I'm gonna show you a couple other clinical pictures, what about the epidermis? The epidermis is warty. It's got a prominent papillomatosis with dramatic hyperkeratosis, right? It looks almost like a verruca or a seborrheic keratosis. So does anyone know what name we call this when we have a type of chronic lymphedema that gets warty reactive epidermal change? Some people even argue there might actually be some HPV driven verruca type stuff growing in here, although I'm not sure if that's fully proven. I, I suspect it's mostly reactive, but what is the fancy Latin name that we can give to this? Elephantiasis, nostroscaricosa. Yes, elephantiasis, and I think the other person was probably going to say the same thing. Uh, elephantiasis, nostros verrucosa. Everything's gotta have fancy Latin names in derm and derm path, right? So I've got some pictures. Now this one, this patient, I showed you the clinical photo. Uh, even though focal areas had that kind of verrucous change, overall, she does have some degree of kind of elephantiasis, uh, arguably because of the large, the, the large extent, expansion of the legs and the tissue around them with lymphedema. But overall, I don't appreciate much verrucous change here. There may be some focal areas that have some verrucous change, but overall not much. But I've got some other examples to show you. This is a form of chronic lymphedema that causes massive expansion of the leg um, uh, tissue and, and a verrucous type of epidermal change. I am still not fully clear why some patients get this dramatic verrucous change and others do not, and I'm not sure if, it, if it's fully understood, okay? So um, back to the slide here. So I, uh, I just showed the residents, if you're watching this on YouTube, I just showed some clinical photos. Um, I think they're a little too graphic for YouTube, but I will link to them on a different website down below. So if you want to see those, they are pretty dramatic. Uh, if, you have a sensitive, if you're sensitive about that, don't look at them. But otherwise, just so you know, you've been warned, but I think that they're probably, uh, YouTube will not approve them, but I do have another uh, location where I can host them from. So um, elephantiasis nostris varicosa is this warty change in the surface that come, comes with some cases of chronic lymphedema. And the, the thing I wondered about for a long time is what does it mean? Elephantiasis, I know, means enlargement and kind of expansion of the leg. Varicosa, I can figure out, verrucous, right? But nostris, well, after finally a lot of digging, I found an old article from the early 1900s that explains that, that the idea of this at the time was that elephantiasis was something seen in tropical regions, tropical elephantiasis, either filarial, or some people get non-filarial forms that are not parasitic and that are driven by um, apodoconiosis, I think is the word, when people have barefoot on volcanic soils and they get that silt in and it damages and scars the lymphatics and they get elephantiasis from that. That's not due to a filarial worm. But then uh, this doctor noticed that there were some patients that had elephantiasis in Europe. And so nostris means ours. It's like, this is our form of elephantiasis, ours meaning the, in the European continent, as opposed to the type we see in the tropics. Now, whether that's a totally socially appropriate nowadays, I don't know, but that is the history and origin of that term, that this is something that happens in the non-tropical setting and through a different cause, a different mechanism than the types of uh, elephantiasis that are more often seen in the tropical setting. So in case you ever wondered what the nostris meant, that's what it comes from. And I have a paper that I found about that, and I'll link to that down below in the video description as well. Okay. That is more than you ever wanted about chronic lymphedema, but it's a really important topic and is often overlooked. I often see people miss this, uh, especially when it's more subtle. So do you have any questions about this? And then we'll go on to the last case. Okay. I mean, what else is there to talk about it, right? We've covered it all. All right.